is that you have a small sensor, pretty small data point. So uh, this bearing is, is almost broken. Uh, there's somebody in the room or uh, uh, this cow is now here. Welcome everyone to the voice of innovation fireside chats. I'm Rachel Gordon, an AI and robotics reporter. We're here to take a deep dive into innovation of the future and pervasive AI. Today, I'm talking to Venki Giesman, and if you're familiar with the Internet of Things, he's a huge player in the space. He's the CEO and co-founder of the Things Network, which is an open source IoT ecosystem. He's also founded various startups, he teaches entrepreneurship to eighth graders, and he once provided internet for the entire city of Amsterdam in just six weeks. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the very nice introduction. Uh, maybe there's a bit nuance to the <laughs> to the last bit, but we'll get to that. Really nice to, uh, uh, to be here. Great. So I wanna start a little bit with your background. So you have been involved in startups for net neutrality since 2014. So how did your work in net neutrality influence your current work today in the IoT space and what you're doing at the Things Network? Yeah, so uh, startups for net neutrality was around that, uh, the time that the uh, European Commission and the FCC were deciding on how they would treat uh, uh, yeah, players on the internet equally with regards to uh, the usage of that point. And um, at the time, I... Uh, I was a co-founder and CTO of a, uh, a video streaming service. So for us, it was, of course, very important that uh, all the streaming that we did was treated equally across the networks ac according to the laws that uh, are there with regards to net neutrality. And um, um, and what, what I really liked about, like what, what's really interesting about the internet and how it was created and how like laws like net, net neutrality are, are uh, were created is that uh, the internet should be, let's say, an equal playing field for anybody to innovate on. It's, it should not be dominated by a small group of large players that then decide on what's going to be innovative and what's not. And uh, the link between what we're doing right now is that when uh, Johan and I launched uh, the Things uh, Network in, uh, in, in 2015, we saw that the Internet of Things was emerging. And our idea was, is let's make an open internet um, that anybody can uh, connect to and contribute to without asking for permission and making sure that if you enter, there's always a level playing field to make your venture or your idea or your innovation work. So yeah, they're, they're quite um, uh, aligned, uh, as I say. Awesome. So I want to understand a little bit more about the technological infrastructure behind the Things Network and how that works. Because... You know, we're all searching for that perfect connection. There's so many trade-offs between power consumption and range and bandwidth. And you use something called LoRaWAN to wirelessly connect our devices. But why not Wi-Fi, which is super ubiquitous across the entire world? So can you explain how this works and what applications it's enabled and why you're so excited about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe just to start with the problems that uh, our enterprise customers uh, are facing and how, how they use our technology to solve it, uh, because that really like describes where LoRaWAN uh, uh, how the niche of LoRaWAN is. So, for instance, we have customers that um, uh, they 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 run mining companies or they help mining companies, and then you maybe see these large conveyor belts, and these, all these conveyor belts they have bearings. And when bearing breaks, then the production of the entire mine can go down. So we have customers that are measuring the vibration of these bearings and measuring the condition and can do predictive maintenance. Um, but then, uh, for instance, we also have customers in New Zealand and Australia, and they use it to track cows because they have uh, cattle uh, and they manage without having any fence around them. They're walking freely. Uh, in large areas, and they need to track them, and then they need to have uh, they have air tags that then also have uh, a GPS sensor in it. But you also have, for instance, uh, enterprise customers that want to know where people are in the building, and they want to retrofit the building with movement sensors, so they know in which room are people, and then they can optimize their uh, air conditioning uh, in such a way that, for instance, they can reduce their CO2 uh, footprint and, and meet the Paris uh, and now COP. Uh, 26 uh, targets uh, that are set for buildings. And what they all have in common is that you have a small sensor, 
pretty small data point. So uh, this bearing is, is almost broken. Uh, there's somebody in the room or uh, uh, this cow is now here. And based on the movement, uh, it can also detect if it's uh, about to give labor, for instance. But what these data points have in common, they're very small, they're almost binary. And second of all, the, the networks uh, 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 that are most of the time net, not available, and if they're available, like Wi-Fi and cellular, they, they will make the sensor consume a huge amount of energy. So LoRaWAN fits in a place where uh, you want to have uh, 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 small pieces of data, but you need to be able to install a sensor that can last for a long time, because also you don't want to end up in replacing the batteries every few weeks of these sensors. Most of the time, there are places where you can't reach them. Uh, 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 and, uh, and within the protocol, um, there is uh, a lot of features around security and device management. These are more like the nitty gritty things that um, uh, that, that like the CTOs of the companies we work with uh, are really like. But it starts with that problem. It starts with that solution creates the business case. And the fundamentals are, yeah, that it's now after five years of mature technology. Uh, and, and, and yeah, that's, we, we've used that technology because um, it's also an open uh, technology. So anybody can use it. The, the, the standard is open for anybody to use. Um, and yeah, we now have around a million registered devices we've seen over the networks where we manage in the last uh, uh, five years. So, uh, so yeah, it's going, going pretty well. That's so exciting. And I do love that, you know, your background in net neutrality has influenced this to be an open space for everyone and really democratize that as much as possible. And I'm also wondering where AI is fitting into all of this, because AI focused IoT is growing super fast. And I feel like for most people, they only understand that as far as digital voice assistants, this is Alexa, this is Siri. But, you know, there's potential for so many different use cases. But I'm curious, some, what are some of the challenges in dealing with these really power and computationally hungry applications? And as AI is becoming more pervasive, how are people dealing with running these apps over LoRaWAN networks? Yeah, so if you look at AI on the edge and AI that runs, for instance, at MCUs, what you see, of course, you have TinyML, you have all kinds of platforms and frameworks that, that help you with making uh, these models more simple. Um, but where it basically comes down to is that uh, these networks, they measure uh, stuff. As I said, like it's, it's close to a bearing of a conveyor belt of a mine, right? And the vibrations, they can be very dynamic. They can change over time. But you want to, for instance, have a high quality measurement of saying, hey, like we need to shut down like, or we need to plan uh, some kind of uh, 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 additional maintenance um, uh, uh, and that logic is a bi like that answer is like a binary thing it's like yes we need to make to do maintenance right now or uh, no and then you need AI on the edge to let's say analyze the vibrations and come up with a binary sensor so basically what it's doing is creating quality information out of rough data on the edge and because in most of the times you don't have the bandwidth just to to, to, to send all the data points that you could ever, like that the sensor measures to the cloud and do the processing there. It's, you're not always in that luxurious position. So where you see in the niche where uh, edge AI works is where you can have a clear model on the edge. And basically what you're doing, you're enhancing the quality of that sensor data. Yeah? And you're, you're generalizing and concluding in it to like a data point saying, hey, this needs, um, uh, this is what's going on. The cow is about to give labor. The conveyor belt is about to break, right? So what AI mm -hmm. basically does, it's uh, one of the puzzle pieces, uh, like we're also one of the puzzle pieces that is building and enhancing the data and generalizing the data and, and, and making sure that the data makes sense to a business context. And yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned Edge AI because as an AI and robotics reporter, it keeps coming up for the immense potential to gain all of this insight from the data we can get at the endpoint of our devices. So it was interesting to hear how that's kind of benefiting and fits into your ecosystem. But, you know, since IoT is a market for business, there seems to be this chicken or the egg problem with networks and devices because 
There seems to be also this reluctance to build devices without the proper networks, but no one wants to pay for a network without the devices. So how are you addressing that? Yeah, so what you see happening in Borowan is most of our customers are building the networks themselves. And uh, you can already start building a network with a gateway that costs less than $150. So um, uh, it's it's a trade-off, right? Like either you probably go for a cellular network and then the network comes uh, uh, as a service, or you build a network yourselves and both have their, their different places in the market. Um, so, so basically that that, that that solves the chicken and egg problem. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, it g- gives also a better control of the quality of service of the network. Um, uh, if you build a network yourself, uh, it gives you a little bit more effort to do it. Um, although we make it extremely easy for you to set up these network. But um, uh, what it also can do is to, you can completely control the quality of which the data goes over. And, when you, for instance, have a cellular network, uh, then uh, you really, yeah, uh, are in less control because the cellular operator decides on the quality of the network. And typically in IoT, that can uh, can be sometimes very challenging. Mm-hmm. And what are the biggest barriers for companies that are trying to get started in the IoT space? Yeah, so the biggest barrier now is what I see more of the internal digital transformation uh, challenges. So um, a digital transformation is a, yet another buzzword. So, uh, but uh, what it basically, how we see it as digital transformation is that data points that are harvested through sensors and uh, the, these lower one networks, they end up in a business process. So for instance, we have a customer in the UK and they uh, uh, run uh, and manage uh, a huge amount of social uh, housing uh, real estate. And they want to uh, know uh, all, kind, uh, all kinds of data about the systems that are in these houses. So for instance, they want to measure the humidity uh, of the ventilation system. Uh, based on that, uh, they can plan predictive or preventive maintenance tasks. And we're working with them to directly feed that data point in an existing field force. Uh, application. So they have figured out, like their real innovation is here, is making sure that the enterprise resource uh, uh, planning software that manages the field force is fed with data from IoT centers. And the innovation is making sure that the data point ends up in a business process where it can generate value. So where we now are with MoreOM as a more mature technology is that the puzzle pieces are there. Do you want a network? Cool, we have it tools to, for you to easily set up a network and install a gateway and have it running. You want a sensor? Yes, there are more than 10 humidity sensors with all kinds of flavors and sizes and uh, variations on the market. And the, the, the real, let's say, barrier now is, is, is mostly like almost like corporate and enterprise education and say, like we've had this IoT promise there for years, but now it's really there. And now we need to think about, okay, how is the data point actually going to generate value? And uh, there's one thing we've learned, it's not going to generate any value when it ends up in a dashboard. I mean, after six years now in IoT, there's one thing sure, if you see a graph of your IoT sensor, then you're only at 10%, right? You need to like inject that data into the enterprise IT systems. Right. And so those are the barriers for the businesses trying to get involved in this space. And then on your end, you've described all of these different pieces to the puzzle. So what are the biggest technological barriers and limitations that you're facing to really get IoT out of you know, the mindset that it's still in its infancy and really into a mature um, space that can be widely adopted? Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, what you now see, um, at least for the niche of 401, is that the, the, there's there's a few different very important components. It's the network and the, mm-hmm. and the connectivity. Now that's that's solved. Then you have the answer answer and security and the security and keeping everything secure during distribution and during operations. That's something we secure uh, a solve with a secure enclave. And um, uh, the final uh, um, uh, 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 technical uh, technological uh, challenge is to make sure that you can you will select or create the right sensor for the right problem 
we're doing two things here. We are making a device repository. We have a device repository. We have all the information of all the LoRaWAN sensors in the market, so you can pick the right one. And we've created an open source uh, uh, a LoRaWAN device boilerplate. So if you need to build it yourself as a as an OEM or as a hardware company, then you can pick that boilerplate and use that as your kickstart into a device uh, development. So where's the where's the biggest challenges at the moment? It's making sure that uh, yeah the right device is used for the right type of application. So it feels pretty hard also not to mention security and privacy when we're talking about IoT. It inevitably always comes up. You know these devices do collect a lot of data and it's potentially less secure. So how do we ensure that our data is being protected from bad actors and not being exploited by large tech companies? Yeah. Yeah, so, so security can always be presented as something very complicated or, or saying just complex and it's, it's hard to do. Uh, but but what, what I always say when I talk to the, the business leaders or product managers, I say, say is like just to ask two questions. First of all, uh, 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 like uh, assuming that there's end-to-end -end encryption. And as a, as a product manager, you should ask your technology vendor, well, how, do, like, how does that end-to-end -end security work? Where is the one end of the end-to-end -end security and where is the other end? And the second question you should ask is, where are the root keys stored? These are two critical questions because you can do a build, for instance, on the internet, you can build a VPN, but if the end of the VPN is some kind of data uh, a consuming, like trying to leech on all your metadata to uh, compromise your privacy, the VPN doesn't make sense because the end of the pipe is with a bad actor. So you need to make sure, okay, there's end-to-end -end encryption. That's a standard thing. And uh, this is uh, embedded in uh, uh, the LoRaWAN technology. And also uh, 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 we have created systems that you can decide which actor has what. So it's, if, with our technology, it's possible to use public infrastructure, but use mm -hmm. private root key management, for instance. And a, a second uh, a topic where as a business leader or as a product manager, you should challenge your, your uh, IoT vendors and like, how do we do firmware over there updates? Uh, and and, and how, how can we make sure that once our devices are compromised, I can change things in the device to make sure if it's secure again, right? So sometimes this is a very simple update of the device, just so that I can send something to it and uh, I can change the behavior. Sometimes you need to send a few, like a full blob, right? From over there, update, the definition of that is very flexible. This is what is also possible with LoRaWAN technology. Uh, and the third one, and that has to do with privacy, is that you have to be super transparent if you place a sensor to the outside world. So for instance, if you put it in a public area or you put it in a building, it's it, it's a simple thing, but just make very clear to the outside world, what are you doing and who is storing that data and who is responsible. So um, uh, and these are three things that will be embedded in uh, um, um, bit like security guidelines and CE certification across Europe across the next year. But, and these three things, you, yeah, if you build anything, make sure that your technology, you, it is end-to-end -end encrypted. You know what's the one end and the other end. You know where the root keys are on both ends. Second of all, make sure that you're able to f do firmware out there updates. And third of all, make sure that you're very transparent to the outside world. What are you gathering? What are you doing with the data? And who's liable for uh, for this process? So, and then, yeah, it's very simple in the end. And, most of the technology support these uh, uh, three simple requirements. And, you know, the UK deals with personal data quite differently than we do in the US. Does that affect how your systems would be adopted in the US at all? Or is that completely irrelevant? No, I don't think these rules are, are, are uh, with regards to enterprise IoT. I, I, I don't think these rules are, 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 uh, are very different uh, because, because most of the time with this enterprise IoT, um, we're not talking about personal data. Uh, it's more that it's bit operational, uh, let's say confidential data. Um, um, but um, but I, I, yeah, what you see is like a lot of these systems needs to be designed to be compatible 
according to GDPR regulation in the EU. And and what you, I think most of the time also see is that that you that's then the the standard that you're gonna hold up to. And then most of the time there's not a different uh, version unless you're Facebook, but. I mean, let's get into that, right? <laughs> right, right, right. We can talk about that at another yeah. time. <laughs> so uh, another larger topic besides security and privacy is the environment. You know, the environmental impact of computation continues to grow because more of our everyday items are networked. So do you think about your ecosystem being energy efficient and sustainable and how that uh, overall impact uh, affects the environment. Yeah, I think there's uh, multiple areas. Um, the first area, a lot of the use cases we have are uh, based on uh, improving operational efficiency. And there was a direct correlation with if you are, for instance, making sure that field surfaces are more efficient, you have less uh, mobility movement, less car uh, mileage. Uh, uh, you just di directly by improving a lot of enterprise efficiencies, it correlates directly with uh, reduction of CO2 emissions. So you have a lot of use cases around, uh, around there, around building optimization, around uh, 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 route optimization for um, uh, field surfaces, etc. that that help. Um, then the impact of the technology itself. So are we going to send out billions of devices with batteries and just leave them for, for what it is? Um, uh, yeah, what what you now really see is the emergence of a lot of e-waste regulation, which is uh, we highly support, and um, uh, um, the products that we make. Uh, what we try to do is make sure that uh, uh, the, uh, for instance, the, uh, the the common batteries are used, and there's like at least you're you're tapping into existing circular, uh, uh, let's say, um, economies and that have proper recycling uh, facilities but um, uh, this is a major topic in the IoT and it's also uh, uh, very important because um, um, you need to manage the devices properly you need to know when they run out of battery and either you need to make sure that you dispose of them correctly so through some kind of recycling uh, uh, supply chain um, or, you, or you replace the batteries and uh, and that's a that's an important uh, uh, yeah uh, subject as well. But yeah, this 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 is coming. Um, and um, uh, but yes, important topic. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think for so many people who aren't necessarily well versed in this space of how computation is affecting the environment, they can really only conceptualize, okay, we have physical waste and we have more traditional sources of power and energy that um, are harmful to the environment. But this is a whole new ecosystem that we're learning about and how sending an email can be computationally detrimental and expensive to the environment. So it's, I mean, it's really good to hear that you guys are kind of taking that into consideration when you're building out your systems and being really mindful of five, 10 years from now, how is this going to affect our physical environment? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I want to sure. circle back to something that I talked about in the beginning. When you provided internet to Amsterdam in just six weeks, can you elaborate on this? Yeah, so a single lower one gateway can have a reach of around 10 kilometers, five to 10 kilometers. And when we started and, uh, and Johan and I saw, Johan and I, my co-founder and CTO, uh, is um, is the is that that we thought let, let's just do an experiment let's see if we can find uh, can build a city covering network for when uh, in I think we said six weeks uh, because if you place in Amsterdam ten of these gateways and high buildings you have the city covered almost uh, and and we thought that let's just make this an experiment uh, maybe it's gonna be uh, yeah uh, maybe it's gonna fail maybe not and then we gathered some people around and say hey we're gonna build this Internet of Things network and it's gonna be built by everybody for uh, for everybody uh, and that got a huge amount of traction and then we launched that as an open source initiative and an open platform and we invited everybody in the world now like repeat what we do just copy paste and uh, do that in your city and uh, that went completely viral uh, we did a Kickstarter for some gateways and, uh, and, and electronics and, and, uh, and that kickstarted the whole ecosystem 
uh, of uh, yeah, of people that want to uh, are interested in building these open source solutions. And next to that, uh, that's what we call the Teams Network. And next to that, uh, uh, we have a company which is our open source business model, is the Things Industries. And basically, from there, we uh, started helping uh, large companies around the world by solving these uh, challenges, but then in an enterprise context, not in a smart city context. Uh, and and right. and so yeah, so we created this open source business model, which is now let's say a good balance between um, yeah having these um, uh, yeah having an ecosystem where all kinds of developers, like the the the, the enterprise innovators, but also uh, anybody who wants to get their hands on can do it, innovate, and then uh, they can launch it on the uh, more SLA uh, backed and professional the things industries platforms. And what we call that is that IoT has a zero to one phase. So what you described as the big challenges, like how to get a product to a state where you can scale it, and that's where we want to contribute a lot with open source and with like help all the inventors and the makers. In, anywhere within an enterprise or within a small company. And once they are ready, then we can help them from one to a million with the things industries. Uh, and that is a very complimentary, yeah, nice open source ecosystem model that is now working very well for us. And is that kind of what's next for the things network? And what, what are you guys looking to solve five, 10 years out from now? Yeah, no, so so one of the, one of the um, uh, interesting things that we see and we're now um, with a mature technology that we're more and more involved in these digital transformation uh, projects and it's just very interesting to see how inefficient some things are just because uh, people are used to, to do it like that and uh, sometimes if you go into more traditional businesses supply chains uh, logistical companies it, it's 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 very inspiring and interesting to see how much opportunity is. And sometimes um, like the future is sometimes less crazy than, than what you see right now. We were talking with a utility company that's like naturally employing people to drive in a car just to check if uh, a, a light on a, on a street cabinet is, 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 is red or green. Right. Like, like just put a sensor on that there in there and just, just, send the data over over our network and uh, so yeah yeah the, the most of the things that i'm really excited about is that the technology components are mature and that you, we now see all these companies around the world just sticking them together and making the solutions work for them thank you so much for joining us today it was wonderful learning more about lorawan and your whole iot ecosystem and how you have built all of these solutions for so many businesses uh, th thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it was great being uh, on the show and uh, talking to you. So I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, to the result. Great. Thank you.